Most young scientists are eager to know how to become successful, the key qualities of a successful scientist, and the secret formula for success. So, what makes a good scientist? I ask Google. Scientists are patient as they repeat experiments multiple times to verify results. We have to be courageous. We fail a lot. Must be open-minded. It's about learning from failures. But that's the things you already knew. What does it really take to be not just a scientist, but a great scientist? And what can we learn from those who came before us? And what does it really take to be a great scientist in today's age, where we have all sorts of fancy tools that would make all of our predecessors pretty envious? So firstly, how are we defining a good, or shall I say, great scientist? Well, this is a contentious topic. Should it be based on publication counts, number of citations, impact factor, impact of what, what journal, translatability, lives saved? An alternative is to look at the qualities of good scientists. And according to this article, there are 10 qualities that define successful scientists. Not all accomplished scientists will possess all of these qualities, but most will have many of the qualities. It includes passionate about his or her career, resilient, detail-oriented, yet visionary, a creative thinker, determined, knowledgeable, a team player, self-motivated, an effective communicator, well thank you, capable of thinking outside of the box. So where is the evidence for this list? That is what a good scientist would say. Well, I put some familiar faces on my thumbnail, sharing some successful scientists. So let's take a look at some of them, what they did, and what we can learn from them as scientists. Example number one, Rutherford, going against predictions. Ernest Rutherford contributed to our understanding of the structure of the nucleus. Not my favourite kind of nucleus, but this one, the one that makes up atoms. The centre with protons and neutrons that are surrounded by electrons. Anyway, it was while I was recently reading this book, Foundations, that I relearned how Rutherford made his grand discovery. Rutherford was firing an alpha particle beam at gold foil. The actual experiments were done by Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden with Rutherford directing, but anyway, their assumption, based on the current plum pudding model of the atom, was that the beam would all pass through, like if you threw a dart at some tissue paper. But to their surprise, they saw particles reflected and were like, huh? It showed that their prediction, or the previous predictions of the structure, were incorrect. They were proven wrong, but they were willing to accept that they were wrong and trust the data. And Rutherford then hypothesised that the positive charge of the atom was concentrated in the tiny nucleus and that most of the atom's volume was empty space. So the data drived rational thinking about what is happening and what should be done next. I said all of this is great, but only great if you can trust your data. What if they had set up the detector incorrectly? How do you come to trust your data? Well, we'll touch on tools later in this video, but another way you can trust your data is knowing that you have had the correct controls and tried to answer the same question using different techniques from different perspectives. And who better to look at than Mendel, since it's now been 200 years since his discoveries. Gregor Mendel, through a series of cross-breeding experiments in pea plants, showed that traits can be inherited and that they were inherited by elements or determinants. There was no blending of traits. With the data Mendel collected, he recognised that the formation of reproductive cells and the process of fertilisation explained his segregation ratios. Now, Mendel wasn't the first to study patterns of inheritance, but he was the first to use true breeding strains as the parents, and to quantify his results. The traits he studied were simple, well-defined characteristics, or phenotypes, like round or wrinkled seeds, yellow or green seeds. Mendel's experiments were quantitative, and perhaps it's with his background in physics as well as plant physiology that encouraged him to look at the ratios and see that the genetic ratios were the same, this 3 to 1 segregation pattern, and independent of the traits that he was analysing. And so he designed these experiments so that the answers sort of became obvious. 
And with the information, you can then rethink your hypothesis to explain the data. Mendel's prescient deduction of paired elements that break up their association and separate into different daughter cells is what makes him the founder of genetics. But it was also time that enabled him to make these discoveries. So patience was also key. But do these lessons still apply to 21st century science? Well, now we'll move from genetics to gene editing and to the Nobel Prize winners for chemistry in 2020, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, which they were awarded for their work developing the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing tools. It has, and continues to have, wider-reaching applications. Charpentier identified the RNA components of the machinery, and this caught the attention of Doudna, who was studying RNA. Now, I haven't done either of them full justice here, but you can read full details about this discovery in a couple of books now, so if interested, you should, you should check those out. But what stands out in this example was their creativity and their experimental skills, and also, again, their good experimental design, that led them to elucidate the biochemical activity of the Cas9 enzyme and how it could be applied to actual gene editing. And I have to say, it's a very nice research paper. And so that brings us to today. And how do we go about making more good scientists? Well, we have many tools at our disposal these days, such as CRISPR, proteomics, genomics, metabolomics, fancy microscopes. However, at least in biology, we must generate ideas as well as data, argues Paul Ness, another Nobel Prize winner for uncovering components of the cell cycle. Researchers should know why the data is being collected, what hypotheses are being tested, and what ideas are emerging. And if I may add, it's important to remember that despite our fancy techniques, many of them still have limitations, so it is important to not solely depend on one method for an answer. Now, I could talk a while about my advice for a PhD, but I will hold back now until I actually get mine and publish my research, as who am I really to say all this? Am I a good scientist? Well, my citation score, etc. is definitely not great, but I don't think I'm a bad scientist. And by no means is it a dichotomy. Believe it or not, I could still be more organised, more critical and more focused. But I would also say, if I was just cloned and everyone was like me, scientific progress would also be stifled. It's the differences and perspectives and collaborations with different minds and techniques that move science forward. And of course, good experimental design. (laughs) Get those controls in there. But if you're not happy with my answers, well, lucky you, WikiHow has an 11-step guide on how to be a good scientist, but YouTube thinks you'd rather watch this video here. And so I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, and thank you for listening.